We wanted to be, and we all wanted to be, president for life. Aspiring to be past president is akin to believing that the best seat in the parade is hauling a sawdust barrel and shoveling a golf cart behind some overstuffed pachyderms. Admittedly, you may be closer to the action, but the view stinks. The real problem with being a past president is that it happens so suddenly. It's a shot out of the blue. We know it will happen eventually, but it's like death. It comes at the wrong time, and it's without the afterlife. There are, there are no end-of-career ovation tours like those reserved for every retiring utility infielder in the major leagues. There's no period of adjustment about which Tennessee Williams artfully wrote more than five decades ago. Regrettably, with a past president, when it's over, it's just over. A rotary past president is yesterday's birdcage newspaper, discarded to the dustbin of history. Bad, but not quite as bad as being a retired pope. One day, your God's right hand, the next, just another sinner. Becoming a past president creates a condition or syndrome, and I say that with all reverence and as a cradle Catholic. Becoming a past president creates a condition or syndrome that I reluctantly refer to as postpartum presidency. <laughs> this is not an ailment that can be addressed with a 12-step program or even with Obamacare. Rather, it's a status of the mind rather than a state of mind. However, with our aging population of past presidents and their ever-expanding numbers, it is a condition that demands attention, not the NSAs or the CDCs, but your attention. I may not be around when the cure comes. Ironically, that may be the cure. But in the meantime, I'll probably just have some buttons made for our past presidents which say, hug a past Rotary president, they need love too. <laughs> until then, until then, I thank you for sharing this therapy session with me. Thank you, past president Jim. Uh, it really is a pleasure for me to introduce Mark Worms, the Executive Director of Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest. I met Mark about two or three years ago. I think it was at the uh, Bloomfest, which is a, a, uh, it's a spring program put on by, uh, by Bernheim, and I was really impressed with him then, and I'm really impressed with him now. Mark is a fabulous conservator of nature, and he oversees this 14,000 acre jewel we know as Bernheim Forest, just south of Louisville, including a 250 acre arboretum and a visitor center that is really a casebook study of how to do it right for green construction. Mark is a great guy. He is a botanist by education and training, but he holds a PhD from Boston University in uh, ecology. Uh, he lives in Louisville with his wife and two kids, and it really is a pleasure for me to see him again and introduce him to Rotary. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. Um, Rotary is one of those organizations that I hope to be much more involved with in the future. You guys are always full of energy and doing great things around the community and around the world. And, and that's really exciting. Um, I want to start today, although I'm, I think half of my talk has been given between the, uh, the uh, prayer and Phil's introduction, you guys know a lot about Bernheim right now. But I would like to start today with my own survey. Raise your hand if you've ever been out to Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest in your life. Hey, that's pretty good market uh, penetration, isn't it? I think that's 100% or darn near it. 
How about, we're going to push this a little bit farther. How about the last five years? Oh, wow. I'm impressed. I love it. Love it. All right, now I'm going to put me on the spot. How about in the last year? Who's been out to Rotor, or <laughs> out to Bernhard? All right, pretty good. Well, we have a little work to do because our hands dropped off quite a bit, and there's been some big changes in the last five, year at Ber five years at Bernheim. And so today, I want to give you some idea of where we've been, where we are today, and why you should bring your family and friends and your businesses out to Bernheim, because a lot of great things are happening out there. And we can start with, you know, many of us think of Bernheim as something like this a beautiful place for trees. And in fact, Arboretum does mean trees. And as Phil knows, if you've got trees, you've got bluebirds as well, don't you, Phil? Uh, he's a bluebird man, if you, you don't know it. Um, Bernheim has beautiful tree collections, is known around the world for its horticulture activities. And whether it's oak trees or hollies, or one of my favorites, this beach collection, with, in fact, one of my favorite trees is on the left there, the tricolor beech, a pretty rare tree showing its spring color. So you may think of Bernheim as that. You may be thinking of Bernheim as more like this. Bernheim is a big place, almost 15,000 acres, much of it very natural lands. And 15,000 acres is 23 square miles the size of the island of Manhattan in New York City. Only instead of having millions of people, we've got millions of trees. We also have a number of streams that we control headwaters of. We have 40 miles of hiking trails, including a new five-mile trail that we opened just last spring. You may be thinking of Bernheim as something like this, our beautiful canopy tree walk which by the time you go to the end, you're 70 feet above the forest floor, looking out into one of the beautiful valleys that we care for. But how many of you think of Bernheim like this? This is the roof of the American Life Building, Nana Lampton's building, right uh, just a few doors over. And Bernheim has experimental plots on that roof and care for that roof under a contract with American Life. And we do that because we think that green roofs are great for a city like Louisville in countering the heat island effect, in uh, controlling storm water, in providing beauty, and all kinds of other things. Here's our crew just recently on the roof of the new nucleus building of U of L. We've installed a green roof up there so that those entrepreneurs can get out, enjoy the skyline of Louisville, and do creative business thinking on the roof. Uh-oh, I hope you don't think of Bernheim like this too often, but unlike the West, this is a controlled fire. It's one we set. It's called a prescribed burn, and we did it in order to restore this grassland habitat. Fire kills off invasive species and bring back, brings back the seed bank. This is all possible because of our founder, Isaac Wolf Bernheim, who came to America as a poor German immigrant, the age of 16, and he literally sold Yankee notions, uh, carried on his back, door to door, up in New England. He eventually made his way down to Kentucky where he met his brother. They bought a horse and wagon and began to move bourbon around the, around the area. From there, through hard work and living the American dream, they started their own distillery and were known for the I.W. Harper brand of bourbon. Now, he thought this was such a wonderful thing that at the age of 65, he wanted to give back to the people of Kentucky. So he bought nearly 14,000 acres of logged and kind of worn out land just south, just 20 minutes south of Louisville. But he knew that nature was restorative. He also believed that nature was a great equalizer and that all people would benefit from being in nature regardless of race, creed, or economic status. And that's the vision we try to fulfill today. He also set up an endowment at that point. And today that endowment pays for about 60% of Bernheim's operating costs 
which is a very strong base for a not-for-profit organization. But we're out there raising that other 40% by activities at Bernheim and fundraising. Our mission is connecting people with nature. And we do that in so many ways. We do it by having places for picnics. We do it through classes. We do it through special events. And we do it by letting kids roll down a hill. Our vision is a beauty, recently adopted by the board. It is that Bernheim will be a nationally treasured leader in ecological stewardship that inspires the exploration of our deep connections with nature. Now, I could spend 20 minutes just on that statement alone. But to be a nationally treasured leader means you have to think big and act boldly. To be an ecological stewardship a steward, you have to look at systems, not just the immediacy. And to, be, to, to work for deep connections with nature means that you have to really think about what will change people's lives. We have a proud history at Bernheim of being an ecological steward. This is our visitor center. It was the first platinum lead certified building in a five state area eight years ago. We were hoping by now every building would be LEED certified. It's as green a building as you can build. But we're going to take that legacy and push forward. And just last week, our Board of Trustees adopted a new strategic plan. And what I'd like to do is spend a moment going over some of the big ideas that informed that plan. There are four of them. The first is exploring deep connections with nature. The second is uh, leadership in ecological stewardship. The third is actions beyond our border. And the fourth, thought leadership. So let's go through them real quickly. Exploring deep connections with nature means that it's not just about quantity of people coming out. We already have about 200,000 people coming through Bernheim a year. It is about changing people's lives providing experiences that are second to none, providing experiences that are meaning to the, meaningful to the individual. And that might be enjoying the beauty that nature itself provides, such as this Sephora tree that welcomes you to Bernheim just inside our gate. It might be taking a walk and getting your thoughts together, a little tranquility from the hubbub of day-to-day -day life. And whether that's by yourself, with your family, or with a loved one in hand. It's a beautiful place to be. We also use the arts to connect people with nature, because arts is a way to interpret nature. I'm always amazed by what comes out of an artist's mind. It is not my mind. It is always something that I can only wish for. And our arts program has 30 years of history with artists and residents coming to Bernheim, living at Bernheim, for weeks and months at a time from nations all over the world. They go home ambassadors for Bernheim and for Louisville. But our artists program also involves this kind of activity, which is a willow sculpture by an internationally known artist, Patrick Doherty. Snake Hollow will only last about two years on our grounds before it starts decaying and we will then chip it up and put it right back into the garden. And so in many ways, art is about time. It's about perception. We continue that really wonderful legacy with the arts with a new sculpture that will be opening just next month. On October 17th, we'll do the public opening for Earthworks, or Earth Measure, excuse me. Um, this is a, a sculpture by a local artist, Matt Weir. And Matt has done this piece out of limestone, so it's a permanent piece in honor of Barry Bingham Jr., who of course me meant so much to this community and served on the board of trustees of Bernheim for a very long time. The shapes of this work are, are indicative of Barry's first use of satellite dishes in his communications and his love for photography, particularly nature photography at Bernheim. And so you'll be hearing a lot more about this beautiful piece, Earth Measure, 
over the next few weeks, months, and years. By the way, many of our arts programs are supported by donors, and many of them anonymous, so we love that. But deep connections with nature start early. And in this case, our children's play garden even uses its structures that protect you from sun and shade in creative ways to stimulate that imagination. Tree trunks for columns, living roofs, octagonal shaped roofs, and wonderful things uh, to be found in the concrete. But what it's about is getting kids outdoors where they can be healthy and their imaginations can go wild. And we know that every child can fly when they're in nature. Our second big idea is leadership and ecological stewardship. And again, playing off of our history with the visitor center, you can see a kind of a ground uh, level or tabletop level view of a test bed that was supported by the Brown Foreman Corporation. Allows us to uh, test what plants would work in a rooftop environment. But it also allows the public to see these kinds of experiments as well. And again, we use controlled burns or prescribed burns to bring back habitats. In this case, a, a grassland hillside. And why? Because you result with beauties like this prairie. All these seeds are waiting to come up and fire sets them free. And when you have healthy habitats, other discoveries occur, such as this dainty sulfur butterfly. It's found nowhere else in a five county area except at Bernheim. And with healthy habitats, you can reintroduce species that have been lost over time. How many of you used to hear Bob White quail when you were a kid, right? How many of you heard Bob White quail as an adult? Not very many, a few hunters out there, I think. Not very many. But Bob White quail died off about 30 years ago because of drought, bad winters, and habitat change to pastures and fields. And now Bernheim is reintroducing those birds to our lands and they're already invading some of our neighbors and coming back very strong. It's our belief that Bob White quail are part of the natural ecosystem and that everybody should have an opportunity to see one and even better, hear one. They get their name from their call. Bob White, Bob White. That's as good as I can do. I'm sure there's some betters out there. Um, with, with Bernheim being so large, we control the headwaters of Wilson Creek. And we have restored a section of Wilson Creek. So now it's this wonderful meandering stream with beautiful habitat and rich in wildlife. And we can do something that very few other organizations can do. And that is because this stream is so clean, we can immerse children in nature. And here, these kids are looking for crayfish or darters or some aquatic life. And unfortunately, it's an extremely rare opportunity these days to have kids actually in the water looking for things. And we do that with every community and every group of kids that we bring out because in our deep connections with nature and in our ecological stewardship, we're bound and determined to determine to find that next naturalist, that next horticulturalist, that next scientist, no matter where they come from. We also do a lot of research. Research with universities from throughout Kentucky, but also from throughout the United States. We have research going on with uh, such far-flung rivals as Michigan and Ohio State and Pennsylvania and UCLA and many others. And in this case, here's a seedling of an American chestnut. One of the seedlings we're growing as a consortium to try to find a blight-resistant chestnut to reintroduce into our fields and streetscapes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? They're such magnificent trees. Actions beyond our borders is our third big idea. And here we say Bernheim's this beautiful place just 25 minutes south of Louisville but it's a place with a mission. And what we want to do is bring that mission out beyond our borders and get in the communities all around us. In this case, another living roof um, on the Louisville Metro Archives building on Industry Street, testing plants, trying to figure out how to fight off that heating of the city. 
We also have a group of plants that have been tried and tested and grown at Bernheim. And they do great in our rough soils and this, this changing climate. And we call them Bernheim Select. There are some local nurseries that are beginning to carry these trees under our brand. And the idea is, if you plant these Bernheim Select species and varieties in your yard, you won't need to water them quite as much, or you won't need to use fertilizers and pesticides, so it's better for the environment. One of my favorites is the black gum, Nissa sylvatica, because it's great for wildlife, it's got a beautiful shape to it, and the fall color can't be beat. We're also involved with other organizations. Bernheim can't do all this by itself, but we're proud to partner with all kinds of organizations. We have, uh, we're working with Maryhurst right now on their new campus and, and edible landscape design project. What a great group of people that is to work with. You heard last week from Gil Holland about the Portland project. Here is uh, Bernheim helping with that project where with some simple, simple materials and the imagination of children, suddenly a playground was put up in 10 minutes for those kids to enjoy. That is strong. Thought leadership is our fourth big idea. Now this, you know, these things all kind of intertwine. So thought leadership is about ecological stewardship. It's about all kinds of things. But it's also about presenting new ideas, partnering with people to be experimental, push the envelope. So how many of you have been to a Pechicucha? Oh, okay, a couple of you, great. For those of you who don't know that format, each speaker on an evening gets 20 slides, and each slide is on the screen for only 20 seconds. So in 400 seconds, that speaker has to tell their entire story or idea. And that means in one evening, you can hear 10 or 15 wonderful new ideas and thoughts. Pecha Kucha started in Louisville at Bernheim around our lake. It's now been held in many different venues every quarter, 21C. And the latest one was just on the uh, Louisville Metro Hall, uh, where they talked about education. If you have an opportunity, check it out. I'd like to spend a moment with you to talk about this thought leadership project, and that is our edible garden. For the first time in 84 years, Bernheim will use food to investigate deep connections with nature. But the way we're doing it really shows some of the thought leadership behind it. We have a Platinum LEED certified visitor center, which you get points in the LEED system for being less bad as you build. In the Living Building Challenge, this new kind of sustainable criteria that's coming out of the West Coast, you actually have to emulate natural systems and you get points taken away when you deviate. And it's very, very rigorous. It's a pain in the head. It is a tough set of criteria. But the idea is, if Bernheim can do a living building challenge for this edible garden, then that means those criteria, those environmental criteria, can be applied everywhere. And so our garden is going to be uh, uh, three phases. The first phase is under construction, and we hope to open it next spring. And it involves a new retention pond. All the water that we will use in this garden will be collected on site. No city water will go into this garden. All that water that's used and then comes back out will be filtered by a wetland that we've built before it goes back into our streams and lakes and into the earth. We will generate more power through solar energy on this site than we will use in a year. And we will use only very select materials, reusing materials when possible. There's a whole list of materials we can't use in this site, and those are called red lists. One of the ones that you may appreciate is that PVC and PVC pipe is highly toxic at one point of its life cycle. And because of that, we will have no PVC pipe in this entire garden. It's really a different way of looking at true sustainable costs of doing business. 
And so this garden in phase one will have the pond and the wetland, but it also have this petal shaped series of raised beds where we will grow vegetables and be able to show off great practices for the home. Phase two is about a new garden pavilion, whoops, which is open to, which is, oh, whoop, there we go, which is open to the public um, and open to the garden on two sides, but is covered by earth on two sides. And by mounding earth to this building, we can take a switchback trail and lead everybody right to the living roof on this building where we'll be growing vegetables and also provide a wonderful observation deck to overlook the entire garden. By the way, it's very important that these gardens be beautiful. And so it'd be a great place to have a cocktail party. <laughs> um, one of the things we want to do is not only show best practices of how to garden, but we're going to bring science and math to life in this garden. And again, it needs to be beautiful. Here's a shot just recently of phase one under construction, one of those raised beds areas. And you can see already, it's a beautiful space for weddings or school groups. And we do thousands of school kids a year. And so we're going to have a lot of fun with that at the Edible Garden. One other big thought leadership idea that I want to make you aware of, because it's right around the corner. The beginning of October, we're offering a Children at Play conference at Bernheim. It's part of a two-year grant that we just received from PNC Bank Foundation. And what it does, it looks at the scientific and academic value of free play, play in nature, on the development of children, particularly the development of their imaginations, development of their social skills, and, and their school readiness. And so if you're interested in child development, children at play might be something for you. So again, as you think about Bernheim and you come out to picnic or walk or you come out to one of our special events or educational classes, I hope you'll also keep in mind that over the next 10 years it will be shaped by four big ideas, including exploring deep connections with nature, leadership in ecological stewardship, actions beyond our borders, and thought leadership. So whether you think of Bernheim on the landscape scale, by the way, this is the look off of that canopy tree walk, 70 feet above the forest floor looking at one of the valleys we care for. If you look at us, it, a big, beautiful place to explore, or you look at us as a smaller scale place to find beauty in nature, there's always something for you to do to connect with nature at Bernheim. Thank you very much. <laughs>